It is a pleasure to be here with you this morning, to worship with you every week. And um, I am always in awe. Um, this pulpit is not my pulpit. It is nothing that I am entitled to. And so to have the opportunity to bring a message before you uh, is an honor and a privilege that I do not take for granted, um, and yet I cherish the moments that we have together. Um, this is a message in a series of messages on the seven I Am statements that Jesus um, says and are recorded in the Gospel of John. And the work that has been laid out for you the last two weeks has been tremendous, and I build upon that and hopefully lay some more down for those uh, weeks yet to come. And, and uh, the, the message that I'm going to share today is, I am the door of the sheep. And uh, this will be out of John chapter 10, uh, and, I, and I, I, this is part of a section of Scripture in, the, in, in John 10 that is oftentimes called the shepherd discourse. And in two weeks, Craig Terrell will be building on um, that, that second, sort of the second half of, uh, of chapter 10 of, of John's gospel. So if, if I were to stand before you today and to say to you, the kingdom of God is like Starbucks, okay? Chances are many of you would be scratching your head and saying, I have no clue how Starbucks could somehow align with the kingdom of God. Now, that's not why I put this up here. Here's why I put this up here. When I put the Starbucks logo up on the screen, chances are everybody in this room would know that Starbucks does coffee and does lots of different styles of coffee. They have developed their own language, their own options, and their own prices uh, for coffee. And, and even if you are like me, I do not drink coffee. I never have. I, drink, I grew up, my mom and dad were huge coffee drinkers. And I remember growing up young with two things, the sound of the percolating of the coffee and the smell, the aroma. But somehow for me, it stopped there. It stopped there. It skipped a generation because I have daughters that just absolutely just love coffee. Um, but for me, it, it, just, it just stopped there. Yet even though I don't drink coffee, I still understand that if you were to come up to me and say something about Starbucks, I would make a connection. Today, we need to connect with this. That's a sheepfold. And chances are that unlike Starbucks, very few of us in this room can look at that and grasp it at the same depth that we can something that we are familiar with from the day in which we live. And yet for those who were reading John's gospel and hearing these words for the very first time, they understood this. They understood concepts. They understood sheep. They understood shepherds. They understood the, the profession or the tasks involved in, in, in quite a depth. And so for Jesus to use phrases that included sheep and shepherds were for the people hearing it, they understood. But for us, not so much. And so my task today is two things. Is one for us to understand fully as best as I can share with you the sheepfold. But then also, as is the reason why we're here, to draw a connection between why is it that Jesus talks about being the door for the sheep? What, what is the spiritual significance of this? And, and, and this is all built around, in essence, the, um, John chapter 10, and we're going to look at the first six verses um, as, as we start this. Now, I must confess that everything that I know about sheep I learned from Russell McCall. Now, if anybody in this room knows who Russell McCall is, I will be blown away because Russell McCall, who I'll tell the story of later, is a now late uh, farmer 
uh, from New Concord, um, where I spent about 40 years of my life. And Russell and I got to be good friends and uh, very, very near and dear men, a very godly man. And uh, he taught me everything I need to know about sheep, which isn't as much as some other people might know, but it's going to get me out of the sermon today. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Russell, for that. Let me read for us these first verses, first six verses of the Gospel of John. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So as, as we begin looking at this, I want to start out with just these, these three um, areas, just to kind of lay the groundwork for what we're going to talk about. Seven I am statements. Were there more than seven? And John just recorded these seven. Why did John include these? Why are they not found in the synoptic gospels? What's the significance of these? And in many respects, we, we really don't know the full depth of why these are here. And, and I can only say this from my own perspective and what these phrases mean to me. And for me, this is a description of the character of God through the character of Jesus. Of him saying, I am the, whatever it would happen to be. And, and, and these seven, as they are discussed through, through the messages, through these seven through the seven messages of which I'm the third, we learn more and more about who God is. But what we also learn in each of these is not something that creates distance between us and God, but brings us closer. And as we'll see today, being the gate, in essence, the door, the, the, the passageway into the sheepfold, is something that is written specifically for us. He starts out with, verily, verily, depending on the version of Scripture that you're looking at. And as I as have always been taught, and I'm sure you have before, it's like, you know, everything in the book is important, but pay attention to this. Pay a little closer attention. This is important stuff that I'm going to share with you right now. And then, of course, it's a conversation with the Pharisees. Now, you and I all know, as we have read through the Scriptures, that whenever Jesus has a conversation with the Pharisees, it's sort of like um, the coyote trying to catch the roadrunner. The coyote may think he's got a scheme that's going to work, but it always blows up in his face, sometimes literally. Isn't it amazing, by the way, that that the coyote could have Band-Aids and then 30 seconds later be completely healed. Um, there's spirit, there's a spiritual component to those cartoons. Um, the Pharisees were always trying to capture Jesus. Not just physically capture him, but catch him. Catch him in a way that the people would see him as discredited. Catch him because their perception was that he was a false messiah. Catch him because he was a threat to all that they had created and felt like they were responsible for. And yet in each and every time that we read an encounter that Jesus has with the Pharisees, it does not go well for the Pharisees. It seems that Jesus is a little smarter than they are. It's, it's sort of like that, that whole thing of arguing with a professor over a truth that's in the textbook, 
only to find out that the professor wrote the textbook. And that's what's happening here. They're arguing with the author. And again, it does not go well. So how do we go back? Oops. Now let's go back here. Sheep are in flocks. They're not household pets. Sheep are out in flocks. And they tend to be out in the open, not necessarily in the cities. And because they are dumb, they need to be guided, they need to be led, and they need to be protected. And so the role of the shepherd. And, and I'm sure that Craig in two weeks will elaborate on Jesus as the good shepherd and, and all of the facets of that. And so I don't want to, to dive too, too far into that. But know that the shepherd has a role, okay? And the, shepherd, the, the shepherding was not necessarily a position of esteem, but in many respects was, was a task given to the youngest child in the family or even just hired out. And yet the importance of that role goes without saying. And so sheep are out. They're out in, out in the flock. Shepherd keeping an eye on them, protecting them from attacks from animals, from being stolen by others that would want to steal from that flock. But yet, even though sometimes we see, for instance, in, in the birth of Jesus, you know, we talk about that the shepherds were tending to the flocks at night. So we, we know that, that, that it does happen in the evening. Oftentimes, the shepherds would let, let their flocks throughout the pasturing during the daytime. And in the evening, they would lead them into what is called a sheepfold or a sheep pen. And that's what you see the picture of there. While they might come in slightly different shapes and sizes, for the most part, what you are seeing is probably pretty accurate to what was the case used during the time when Jesus walked the earth. You see stone, it's probably about four or five feet tall. Uh, sometimes that stone was topped off or surrounded on the outside by thistles, therefore making the approach to that wall a little more difficult or a little bit more dangerous. Um, large enough to contain a flock, sometimes more than one flock, and then an opening. I want you to notice what you don't see. A door. There is no wooden door on hinges that you open and close. There is an opening. And so what would happen is, as the shepherd would bring the sheep to the sheepfold for an overnight stay, they would follow him to this opening. And then the shepherd would, using his staff as sort of like a toll gate, an up and down toll gate, would look at each of his sheep individually. By the way, sheep he has named, has a name for each individual one. And before each of those sheep would go into the fold, would actually stop that sheep, would talk to that sheep, and then would examine to see if there were any um, marks from, you know, a little tears in the skin or in the fur or whatever, and then would treat those with some oils and cleanse that wound before the sheep would go into the sheepfold. And then once all the sheep were in, the shepherd would sleep in the opening. He would be the door. He would be the gate. And his task there, and, and I, I don't know if, I don't know what, what, what beauty rest, sealy, Temper perfect. Uh, you know, I think of all those mattress commercials. Not one of those mattress commercials brings me to that. Did he sleep? You probably learned to. You know, in, in my profession of athletic training, I spent a lot of time traveling with teams on charter buses and vans. You'll learn how to sleep in the circumstances that you're in, and I'm sure shepherds would as well but not sleep too deeply because you weren't just the door. 
you are also the protector. So in case somebody would try to, whether it's an animal or another person, would, would try to come and, and vault over, the, gate, or over the, um, the walls to steal something or to kill, then the shepherd would be right there to defend and to ward off anything that would bring harm. Now, it's also possible that more than one flock would be in the same sheepfold. And so in that instance, then two shepherds would let each their, let their own group in, and then you'd have this whole group mixed together. And then in the morning, when in essence the sheep would be let out of the sheepfold and out into pasture, each shepherd would let out his sheep. Again, knowing them by name, knowing them and who they were by different characteristics and different unique things about each of their, their own sheep, would call them out one by one and then take them out to pasture. So it, 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 the shepherds, by the way, not only knew their sheep, but the sheep knew their shepherds. They knew the voice. They knew who they belonged to. And they wouldn't follow the wrong group and go with the wrong shepherd. They would always go the right way. And there's, there's great uh, talk in Scripture about also that, that whole idea of what if one gets lost, and, and I'll, I'll leave that to others um, to kind of share. So that kind of lays out, in essence, a little bit about what it is that's going on with that structure right there. The conversation with the Pharisees continues. I struggled, quite honestly, with that last, with verse 6. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Now, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. And that is that they understood shepherds, that they understood sheep. I, I, I don't want to believe that they're so dull that they didn't understand Starbucks coffee. Okay? What I do believe is apparent in this is that Jesus was trying to make a point and they had no clue what he was talking about. They didn't grasp what he was trying to tell them. And so Jesus then says, in essence, he restates what he's just said, but he tries to make it a little bit more clear. And here, here are the words from verses 7 through 10. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me, hint, hint, Pharisees and others, are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I came across in Psalm 100 and verse 3, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. He's talking about us. Not just us then. He's talking about us now. And so for us to fully grasp sheepfolds and shepherds, we need to put ourselves in the context that we are sheep. Now, there's that whole we're dumb part and we don't need to go there. Um, but we are the sheep of his pasture. So I told you about Russell McCall. Um, Russell um, was a farmer, farmed lots of different things over the course of his lifetime. I first met Russell when he was probably in his late 60s. Um, he lived well into his 90s and farmed pretty much his entire life, was actively farming his entire life. Some of his farm equipment was as old as he was. 
but he still fixed it and used it every day. The property that Russell farmed was located on State Route 83, about a mile north of New Concord. On his property was also the local Grange Hall. Now, the Grange Hall was built with scrap wood and whatever was available at the time. You know, it had an old coal conversion furnace. And oh, by the way, it had an outhouse behind it. No modern plumbing other than water for a sink, cold water for a sink. That's where our church met. For years, we met in an old Grange Hall. And the church flourished. It was the church that I was a member of and would later pastor. And we would put 120, 130 people in this small Grange Hall. And it was, it would be, it was the time, though, if you ask my daughters, they will remember this. You always told, I always told my girls, others would tell their kids, make sure you go to the bathroom before we leave. Because once we get there, it's not happening. But yet we flourished in that environment. And next door to the Grange and across the street from the Grange was part of Russell's farm. And his house was just maybe 200 yards down the street. So at that time, we would have Sunday morning services, Sunday evening services, and a Wednesday evening prayer meeting. And it was my task this one week in particular to arrive early to unlock the facility for our Sunday evening service. And it was, it was a rather mild day, so my guess it was probably somewhere in the, either in the spring or in, in, in the summer, but it was, it, was, it was a mild day. I don't remember wearing a jacket. And so I arrive, and I pull into the parking lot to the church, and I look, and Russell's sheep were on the road. They had gotten out of the, the enclosed area, the fenced-in area that his sheep would normally be in. And I didn't see Russell anywhere. Didn't, didn't see hide nor hair of him, which, which struck me as odd because, I mean, that's, that's his life right there, with his animals, his, his crops. And so his, his sheep were out in Stay Ride 83 is a busy road. So, so being the person, the good neighbor that I thought I should be, I got out of my car and tried to do something about it. And that's when I realized that having grown up in suburban Connecticut, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. But I was going to give it an effort. So I used words like shoe, <laughs> go home, there. And the sheep kind of looked at me, and, and it was kind of like that look where it's like, and you thought we were dumb. And so, I, I got to tell you, nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. Now, praise the Lord, no cars came up 83 either, because that would have been lamb chops, right? And, and so, or no, sheep chops, whatever they are, anyway. Uh, so, that, that didn't happen. And then, all of the sudden, Russell came out of his house. And he said one word. And it wasn't loud, it wasn't um, out of fear or anger. It was just a simple word. And every, I, 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 this as God is my witness, of course, always, the sheep immediately turned their heads and looked at him. They don't look at me other than to say, who is this guy? But they heard Russell's voice. And then he said a second word, and they immediately started walking the path inside the gate into the fenced-in area where they belonged. And, and I noticed that on this, this field in this area where they would, with the entry to it, there was grass all around except for a, a thin, about this wide, a path of dirt and every single member of the flock hopped in line, one right after another, right on that path. And they walked in. And Russell closed the gate and kind of gave me one of these and walked away. As if to say, I got this. I'm the shepherd. 
And boy was he. Boy did, boy did he teach me some things on that day. Things that have stuck with me and, 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 and those that uh, from, from my old home churches, that, that's not the first time I've told that story. It was one, I, I actually think that that, that that evening got over and I thought to myself, that's a sermon illustration. I'm, I'm going to use that for the rest of my life because that's just, that's just too good. So what do we draw from this? Okay, here's what we Jesus is. Others are not. It's as simple as that. When, when Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep, all who have, not some, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers. Now, I'm, I'm not necessarily a thief or a robber, or at least I don't believe I am, but those sheep weren't going to follow me. They knew who the shepherd was. They knew who, in essence, was going to take care of them. And so for us, it is saying Jesus is. He's not an option among many. He is. And all others are not. So hang on to that. And just as the sheep hear the voice and know the voice and run from the voice of others, so we must know his voice. The question not is, do you know his voice? The question is, are you listening to his voice? Or are you letting those other voices kind of rob? Now, there, there's one thing that, that, that I know. Um, when, when your kids are young, you know their cry, don't you? It's like if, 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 if I'm in a, in a social gathering and there's a bunch of, of adults sitting in a room and we're just kind of fellowshipping and, and somebody's crying in the other room, the whole room pauses for a second and said, okay, that's not mine. You know, that's yours. Um, and and, and you know, Because you know, you, you know. And, and there's certain voices that you just, you just know. You know the voice of your spouse in a crowded room. You can just pick it out because you know it. Jesus is a voice, and many others want to dominate the sound of the room. And you listen to him and listen to him only. So Jesus is, others are not, hear his voice, enter and be saved. What does he say? I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Not will hope to be saved, but will be saved. Now, if we connect the dots in this, if Jesus is and everybody else isn't, and we are to hear his voice, then that must mean that he is the only way to salvation. He is the only way into the sheepfold. The people that climb over are thieves and robbers. The people that plow through the shepherd, the other shepherds aren't going to show up and say, hey, I got your flock. No, it's not how it works. Jesus is, everyone else isn't. And then I love this, the last part of this. Find rest and find pasture. In the sheepfold, he's got us. He's going to protect us. He's going to make sure no harm comes to us. We can sleep even when he isn't, to make sure that we're okay. So we can, we can find that rest. We can be at peace. And we also know that as we leave the sheepfold in the morning, that he is going to take us to a good pasture where we will feast well. And I, and I love the way he finishes, Jesus does, where he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, he says, that they may have life and have it to the full. So, so now what? Here's some questions. 
How are you doing? No, 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 no. How are you doing? It's a crazy world right now. Crazy world. You know, I'm, I'm 63 years old. I'll be 64 in December. You can plan ahead for gifts and things like that. Don't. No. So much has changed in my lifetime. The world in which we live. It is scary. And I'm glad the kids are in journey because I can say this in, in their absence. I worry sometimes about kids growing up in our world. And, and, and it's like, what, what, what are we leaving for them? And then I remember Jesus has got this. He's, he's, he's got this. It doesn't, in essence, say we don't, we're not responsible stewards. Those are, those are different sermons. But, but living in that world right now, then, I, I, I'm honestly asking you, in the quietness of your spirit, how are you doing with all of this? How is your self? Are you okay? Because if you aren't, please be. Hang on to one another. Seek out the counsel of other friends and colleagues that can come alongside you and pray with you and, and help to lift you up. Don't, don't be afraid to be transparent and be honest. Guys, that's what family does. And it's certainly what the family of God should do. So how are you doing? That's, that's number one. Secondly, are you safe in the world? Now, here's, here's where we, we, we need to, for a second, define our terms. If you are a believer and that the Lord Jesus Christ has saved you, the Holy Spirit indwells you, and that you are living a life of purpose as ordained by him, you're in the sheepfold. If all of that sounds foreign to you, we want to invite you in to the sheepfold. And that comes through Jesus. And you can come find me. You can find uh, deacons, elders. There's lots of people who would love to guide you through the process of what it means to be a part of the family of God. Of what it means to be okay. Of what it means to be in the sheepfold. Of what it means to be at rest in Christ. And I invite you to do so. Are you prospering in the pasture? Are you being fed? Are you enjoying the riches? Not, not the, the wealth, the health and wealth kind of a thing. That's not what I'm talking about. But as we walk in Christ, there comes with it that sense of being where we're supposed to be and just gobbling all that up. So I hope that's you. Are you living life to the full? And, and, and you might say, but, but, but how do I do that when the world around me is so messed up. See, see that's, that's the beauty of walking in faith. That's the beauty of, of peace, okay? When, when Jesus, this is tangent, this isn't in my notes, but let's, let's have fun with this for a sec, for a couple of minutes. A couple of days later, a few days later after the Passover that we had talked about earlier, The disciples are in the upper room and they are cowering in fear. And Jesus walks in to the room and his first words out of his mouth were, peace be with you. Okay? Now, that has two meanings. There is the peace of that be at peace. But the second is, Jesus is on the scene. And he is peace. So as we grasp in our faith and we hold tight to Jesus, peace is not the absence of war. Peace is being at peace in the midst of war. 
Don't measure your peace and your well-being by what's going on around you. Measure how well you're doing by how well you're doing. How at peace you are. How fulfilled you are and how you are being fed. May that be true for you. How you doing? Jesus is the door. The door for you. The door for me. The door for all who come to know him.